Hello everyone and welcome to Nurses Notes 101. Today we'll be talking about the CCRN exam. It's a layout and all about what to expect on the test. Along with this video, I will be posting other videos of specific content within um, systems of the adult patient. This will really help everybody hone in on what to specifically study in each body system, for example, with cardiac, to look at um, different types of heart attacks like end STEMI versus STEMI. That'll be in my coming videos. Uh, but for this, it's going to be mostly about the layout, what to expect on the test, how to register, how to renew, uh, and two sample questions at the end. So the CCRN exam is for nurses who work in critical care. It is a three hour test, consists of 150 questions, which are multiple choice. Some are select all that apply. And 125 of these questions are scored while 25 are gathered for future exams. The CCRN exam is used to test benchmark knowledge for critical care nurses such as myself. The way um, that this works is through a statistical method. Participants can hit certain questions and already pass uh, the exam, but we do have to still complete the full 150. Nurses who can take the CCRN are current and unencumbered. The nurses need at least 1750 hours of practice in the acute care setting. So in an ICU setting, um, this amounts to pretty much two years of practice. And that's two years off orientation. Your practice will be verified by a professional associate, either a manager or a colleague with whom you work. The test can be pretty pricey, so you want to make sure you do study before and definitely become a member of the AACN or the American Association of Critical Care Nurses because for non-members, the test is 360. For members, it's 240. And then if for some chance, hopefully not, if you have to ever retest, it's 170. So the way you apply for the exam, you're going to go to aacn.org. Uh, fill out the prompts for taking the test. You're going to receive a confirmation email once you get the verification from your associate. And then with the confirmation email, you can utilize that to apply to schedule an exam. I know some of the exams, since COVID has been a thing, have been virtual. Uh, that's something you would have to think about on your own time and see if that's something that works better for you. A lot of times um, people find it quieter to not do tests at home. I've taken tests at home. I don't mind it, but it's up to you where you feel like you'll have a clear space and you'll have um, the best experience taking the test. If you want to renew your CCRN, um, so say the three years is up and it's time to renew, you either have to do 100 continuing education hours, uh, you can renew by exam, or you can actually have an inactive status for your certification. So with the inactive status, you won't be able to put CCRN on your resume or anything like that, but you won't have to pay um, the full fee like you were to take the test again. Um, and you can get an extra three years to complete the CE credits. So as an overview of what to expect on the exam, 80% of it's going to be clinical judgment. So clinical judgment in all of the systems, cardiovascular, respiratory, endocrine, hematology, GI, renal, skin, musculoskeletal, neuro, psychosocial, and multi-system. And then the rest of the 20% will be professional caring and ethical practices. 
So this would be um, response questions to patients, team dynamics, clinical thought process questions. And to leave you off, here are two um, great questions that are very quintessential of the CCRN. So the first question is a clinical judgment question uh, based on cardiovascular system. And the second question is more of a psychosocial question. So first question states that a patient with unstable angina has a balloon pump inserted. Hemodynamics are heart rate of 135, MAP of 45, a wedge pressure of 30, and a cardiac index of 1.2. So this question is asking which should be included in the patient's plan of care. So it's not saying what's the first thing, it's saying what should be included in general. So giving these vitals and giving the patient's current situation with unstable angina, what would be the next step? Um, go through your process of elimination with this question. So I know right off the bat, I can X off a liter fluid bolus. Someone with a low cardiac index, I don't want to give a bolus to. It could um, have them go into heart failure. So that's off the plate. Uh, I also would not want to do D, so cardism. Even though their heart rate is fast, First off, I don't know the underlying rhythm. And second off, um, that could also drop their blood pressure. And since the map is only 45, I would not want to give that. So our only other two options are A and C. If we decrease the balloon frequency, that means the patient um, is utilizing their own heart rate and rhythm for every beat except the third beat. So this seems a little bit risky to me, um, just because if their underlying rhythm isn't adequate to promote enough uh, perfusion. So that one, eh. With C, so it says infuse dobutamine and get a 12 lead EKG. I like the 12 lead EKG because at least we can see the baseline of the patient. And dobutamine is a beta-1 agonist. It is a medication that will um, affect the heart and cause increased contractility utilizing inotropic characteristics. So I like that answer. This answer, um, while the heart rate is already high, I do see that it will help the MAP with someone in cardiogenic shock. And it will increase the cardiac index as well. So I'm going to choose C and not A. For question two, uh, the spouse of a critically ill patient wishes to spend the night, but it's against the hospital policy. The nurse's best action would be to let the spouse stay, board the family member in a hotel near the hospital, Remain adherent to the visiting policy, but explain to the spouse that you apologize and are empathetic to their situation or ask the patient what they would prefer. So in this situation, I know we all would want the family to stay um, just for the comfort of the patient usually um, and to not be confrontational. I know sometimes in these situations, it's hard to tell families no but it's important, especially with coronavirus, that we adhere to visiting policies. Um, so I think the most clear-cut answer for this would be C. So remain adhered to the visiting policy, but be empathetic. So if there's anything else that we could do to assist them in being comfortable with their family member being in the hospital, we could FaceTime them. We could have a phone in the patient's room so they could talk with their family member. They can talk with us. There's different things that we can do. Um, but not break the hospital visiting policy rules. That's also something that frequently happens that I see. So once you are to break these rules with one person, um, not only can that continue to happen with this patient and their other family members, but it can happen with other patients on the unit. 
So it's just something to keep in mind. So the answer for this question is C. I wrote out like an in-depth response to both of those questions and why I chose those answers. Please feel free to leave comments if there's anything you'd want to speak about further and hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for listening.